So um, although the muscles are relaxed, often we'll see uh, some involuntary muscle contractions as well. Uh, so when that happens, the dog or cat might move their leg a little bit, or you'll see some twitching there. Or if it's the diaphragm that's the muscle that's contracting, it looks like the animal's gasping for air. So at that point, the animal has passed away, um, but it might kind of look like they're, like they're trying to breathe or gasping. Fortunately, this usually happens shortly after the animal passes. So uh, in that case, the doctor is available and still in the room to be able to kind of talk the owner through what's happening there. Uh, so speaking of the vet, uh, they will verify the death and they do that by listening with a stethoscope to the chest to see if they can hear a heartbeat. Um, once that heartbeat has stopped, then they will uh, usually give some kind of signal to the owner that the pet has passed. That's going to depend um, by vet to vet, how they handle that. Um, most of the ones I've seen will usually kind of, you know, give a solemn nod and, you know, say I'm sorry for your loss or something like that to indicate that the pet has passed away. Uh, so usually at that point, um, the owners sometimes will like to spend a little bit more time with the pet before the pet is the pet's remains are taken away. Um, once the owner is ready for you to take the animal, um, you can get them bagged and ready for cremation. So by bagged, I mean we put them into a cadaver bag. Cadaver bags are basically very thick. Uh, they just look like black garbage bags, but they're a lot thicker. When you, or when you have them into a bag, you have to place a tag on there and the tag is um, provided by the cremation uh, facility. So in this case, Precious Pets. And they're usually color coded. So they have like a beige card that has all the owner's information on it for private cremation, or they just have a blue tag that says communal cremation or they have a red tag to hold. So if we're not sure what the animal has decided or what the owner has decided yet, we'll just put it, the animal on hold. Um, the owners do have another option. We talked earlier about the options of private versus communal cremation. The owners could opt to take the body home with them. If they choose to do that, typically they're doing that because they want to bury the animal. I will let owners know that it is illegal to bury a body within the city of Winnipeg. So um, if they have like a cabin or, you know, property outside the city that they choose to bury the animal on, that that's fine to do. But inside the city of Winnipeg, it is illegal. That being said, I don't ask them where they're intending to bury the body. I just give them that information and they can do with it what they will. Okay. Um, so if we, they do decide to take the animal home, I want to get that um, the uh, body ready for them to go home. So to do that, I'll usually place them into like some kind of box, like appropriately sized box. Um, I'll usually line it with a garbage bag so that if the animal does pee, it doesn't soak through the cardboard. And then I'll put some nice towels, i.e. ones that aren't holy or covered in bleach stains or something, um, or a nice blanket. I put that on the bottom, I place the body in, and I place the blanket on top so that the body is covered. Uh, in that case then, um, I can send that home with the owner. Sometimes they maybe have brought their own thing for us to send the animal home in, so like maybe a kennel or something, in which case I do all that in the kennel. Um, <clears throat> we do not want to bag an animal until the client has left the clinic. Um, I have had times where owners have left the room and we take the body uh, to our treatment area to get them ready for, you know, going into the freezer and the client uh, comes, you know, wants to see the animal one more time. So like they came out, they said goodbye and then they're like, you know, what, I need to see them one more time. In which case we don't want to have to take them out of the freezer for that. So I usually wait until the owner has not only left the clinic, but like left the parking lot because it's, I've never had an owner come back after having driven away. Well, actually, that's not true. I did have one owner one time that um, the animal had been in the freezer for like a day or two. And because um, like we could put the we put the bodies into a freezer to wait for the cremation uh, company to come and pick them up. And they usually only come twice per week. So they're usually in the freezer for a few days. Uh, and the owner wanted to see their pet one more time. And so we took the pet out of the freezer and thought it out. It wasn't pleasant. So that's the one time. So that's an exception. Uh, okay. So the decision to euthanize might be made for a few different reasons. 
so it could be due to an illness. Uh, usually the illness is going to be terminal, which means that the animal is likely to die from it. It could be that it's too costly for the owner to treat, or it could be that the owner isn't able to give the care that the animal needs for treatment. Uh, it could be that the animal is quite old. Um, sometimes they just, well, I mean, it ages in a disease, right? But often as they age, things just start to shut down. So kidneys and livers, um, they often end up with arthritis and they're just in a lot of pain. So often they get to a point where, um, where they're, they're quite old and the owners elect to euthanize. Um, <coughs> I personally think that the client being too old to care for the pet is not a reason for euthanasia. That's a reason for rehoming, sure, but I don't think a reason to, um, to kill an animal, personally. Uh, behavior problems, I would also say, are a bit of a touchy subject. I think there are some situations where, yes, an animal, it's appropriate to euthanize that animal because of behavior issues. If the animal is attacking people without warning or reason, um, that is an animal that probably is not safe to have as a pet. So that is an animal that I don't think it would be unreasonable to euthanize because of a behavior issue. But um, if it's like there's, it's a cat uh, and it's peeing outside the litter box or something, I don't think there's things that we can do to work with that animal. There's training we can do if we have behavior problems. So I think that those things should be attempted first. We should be referring these people to um, like behavior specialists to work with those animals as opposed to putting, putting them, uh, you know, euthanizing them. Um, so usually, um, what we're talking about when we're talking about whether or not to euthanize is the quality of life. So the definition of quality of life is the ability of an animal to enjoy the things they usually enjoy, things like eating, things like activities, like if they always bark at the mailman and all of a sudden they're not doing that anymore, that might be something to kind of consider as quality of life. Uh, and they should be able to enjoy these things with an absence of pain, distress, or health problems. So I have uh, something else that I linked for you uh, in Brightspace, and that is this quality of life scale. So I'm not going to read through this because I feel like it's pretty wordy, but this is something that um, I developed when I worked at Henderson Animal Hospital based on um, an article that I had read because I thought it was a it was a really good idea to be able to provide a resource to owners to help them when they have trouble making the decision about euthanasia. So ultimately, we talked already. It is the owner's decision in conjunction with the vet to make uh, the choice to euthanize, um, and lots of people, like I said, feel a lot of guilt about making that choice. So this quality of life scale can help them to figure that out, right? So there's questions here about the pet's quality of life. So the owner basically just has to, you know, state whether they agree or disagree. And then you add up your results from that and it'll give you indications of whether or not you're concerned about quality of life. So quality of life is most likely adequate. So in that case, you're probably not looking to euthanize. Quality of life is questionable. So at that point, you're kind of, you know, 50-50 on it. Quality of life is a definite concern. So when we get into this realm, it's not unreasonable to be thinking about euthanasia and when you would like that to happen. Then there's a part two, and I think this is really important because sometimes people really think like, oh, but I don't know, my animal doesn't seem like it's that bad. I feel like I don't want to rush to make the choice. But the relationship with the animal is really strained because of these family concerns. So in this section, um, the owner, all the people in the family are asked to state whether or not they're concerned a little bit or uh, sorry, concerned, a little bit concerned or not at all concerned about these things. And then you add those up, right? And um, so the first is your concerns are minimal, uh, your concerns are mounting, and your concerns about your pet are valid. So these kind of indicate that that family's quality of life matters too, right? So <clears throat> I find often, and I think this is, uh, <clears throat> this is kind of funny. Well, not funny to like, ha ha funny, but it's interesting to me how this occurs. So people will have pets that are in uh, maybe a fair bit of pain, 
they're not really enjoying life anymore they're just sleeping all the time um, but every now and again they'll get like a little burst of energy and they'll be really sweet and want to cuddle or play for a little bit and then people are like well I don't want to make that call yet because I feel like they've got some life left in them but as soon as they start soiling on the carpet, they're like, oh, he doesn't have control of his bowels. It's time to euthanize, right? So I find that's where those family concerns come in. Maybe they can deal with the pet's quality of life being a little bit degraded. But as soon as that family concerns um, amp that up, then it becomes time to euthanize, right? So I found this quality of life skill is a nice thing to have on hand. So I did link it for you so you have an example and you can look at that. Um, it can be a nice way to help owners kind of coach them through the decision making process without telling them, yes, you shouldn't euthanize or no, you shouldn't. Because it is 100% a private choice. Uh, so sometimes a decision is made quick. Um, so like I've definitely had times where people have come in thinking that their pet is normal and then it's euthanized by the end of the appointment because it was really severely ill and they didn't realize, right? Um, and then there's other owners that never decide to euthanize um, and they, they maybe just wait for the owner or for the animal to pass away at home. And that's okay too. Uh, again, it's whatever the owner is most comfortable with, right? Like if the client is very uncomfortable with the idea of euthanasia but is okay with the animal dying at home then that's maybe the best thing for them uh so again typically it's decided because of that perceived suffering so the quality of life between the owner and the pet okay so let's talk about some of the things that staff should be doing in clinic while um while euthanasias are going on so first of all don't ever tell the owner what they should do, even if they directly ask you, what would you do? And this will happen to you, guaranteed. People will say, oh, he's so sick. I, can, I know it. I can see it. What would you do? Is the time right? And I always tell them, you'll know the time is right. Like, it's, it's your call, right? Like, you know your animal best. You'll be able to make that judgment call when it comes time. If they ask me that question, that's when I pull out the quality of life sheet, uh, that scale, and I show them that to help them make the call. Um, it's not my choice. It never will be. I don't want to be the person that says, yeah, go for it. I don't want to be the person that says, no, you could never. Because typically owners already have a way that they're leaning in their heart of hearts, but they just don't want to admit it to themselves yet. So they're looking for someone else to um, like, validate that feeling right so if you give if you give them like yeah you should but they were thinking no that's gonna that's just gonna make them feel more conflicted so i always tell them that that's something that they need to uh come to that decision on their own uh it is absolutely crucial that euthanasias are handled in a super professional manner and the reason for that is uh, do I have yes any discretions will be magnified in the eyes of the client and it's so true well we might do a few euthanasias maybe every day uh, definitely at least a few every week um, owners typically do this maybe two three four times in a lifetime depending how many animals they have it is a very emotionally raw time for them. Anything that feels uncomfortable or icky or wrong, they're never coming back to your clinic again. Guaranteed. Um, I would not want to go back to a place where I felt at end of life uh, visit was disrespectful or rushed or um, unpleasant in any way. So people aren't going to return to the site of that trauma, right? So uh, make sure you're handling things in a very professional manner. Uh, so one way you can do that is be making sure that you can talk about it and deal with it without becoming really overly emotional. So we don't want to appear cold and uncaring. We don't want the owners to think that we don't care that we're so used to euthanasia, it doesn't even matter anymore. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to be like sobbing in the room, okay? Um, the owners are looking to us to be their source of strength and support while they're in the clinic. Uh, so we need to be that for them. I think it can definitely, it can be really sad sometimes. And there, you're going to have to make a judgment call because there are, you know, maybe you've been in the biz for a long time. And one of your very first days of work, there was this cute little puppy um, and you loved him and you've always thought he's special because you remember him from one of your first couple days at work. And now 10 years later, it's time to euthanize him. 
you've built a long relationship with this animal and with that those owners that can feel really sad so i don't think it's inappropriate at those times to maybe shed a couple tears with the owners but like if you're bawling your face off um just because you see like a euthanasia on the on the schedule or because the own or the because the animals in the back getting sedation or something um maybe work on that a little bit um you know there sometimes I'm, i always recommend therapy but therapy might be a good choice for you if those kind of things are really difficult so you can kind of build that emotional toolbox okay um so how I approach it is I always just try to be empathetic. I walk in the room with like, um, you know, yeah, like an empathetic facial expression. Like I'm not like frowning or sad crying or like grinning and smiling and be like, hi, it's Laura here. I'm your tag. I want to try to present like a professional, uh, solemn appearance. Right. Um, and I want to make sure that I'm not, yeah, like crying in there. Uh, okay, so we want to be respectful and discreet. So we don't want to be having non-work related conversations either in front of the client or on the other side of the door while they're in the comfort room. Uh, we want to keep conversations to a minimum in the clinic in general while there's a euthanasia going on. We want to keep it quiet. We want to keep it private. We want to keep it respectful. Maybe you've seen some facilities will have like a picture and a candle that says something along the lines of, um, you know, some, like someone's losing a loved one today. Please be respectful to remind people in the waiting rooms to be quiet as well. So uh, this section, um, I kind of modified yours a little bit to include the roles of the VOA. So these are just kind of like tips for the staff in general, like be quiet and be respectful. Um, oh wait, I think there might even be, yeah, sorry, there's a couple more on this side, so let's just finish this up. Um, avoid comments that might make them feel worse. So things like, oh, well, it was his time anyway, might kind of make them feel, well, wait, are, is she saying that I should have done this sooner? Um, I'll usually say things like, um, you know, they had such a good life with you or something like that. That, that's a little bit more comforting. Um. And then don't mention getting a new pet. Ew, that is so tacky to say something like that. Like, oh, do you think you'll be back with a new puppy soon? That's not the small chat you want to make. So don't say things like that. And then don't bag the animal until a client has left the hospital. Uh, okay, so I just want to go back to this one, one, two. I didn't write them all out here, but I guess I probably should have. I typed them into yours, so you do have them there. But um, this is basically like the VOA rules. Actually, I'm just going to write them on a piece of paper. I think that'll be a little bit better. For me. So the VOA rules. So tasks that you can do during a euthanasia. Uh, so the first one that I have is providing privacy as much as possible. Okay. Um, and comfort. So that's where saying things like... Um, you know, you gave them a great life, things like that. That can really help them with comfort. Uh, two, you're going to be educating owners, right? So you're going to be talking to them about their options around cremation and mementos, um, the procedure itself. You're going to be educating them how the procedure goes and um, how we take care of the remains after. So that's a big part of your role. Uh, confirming their wishes. <clears throat> so seeing which things that they want uh, getting the consent form signed uh, processing payment um, you can assist the RVT with sedation and the IV catheter. So like doing things like restraint. And you can bag the body. Again, only after the client has left. And lastly, uh, you can send a condolence card or flowers. I think that's a nice touch to do. At least the card, I think, 
Um, I think all clinics should be doing at least the card. Uh, and if there's budget to allow like flowers as well, or I've seen, I think this is really nice. Honestly, I've seen some clinics will send a donation to like, let's say the Humane Society or something in, uh, in your deceased pet's name. And I think that's kind of a nice gesture as well. Uh, so those are things that the VOA can be involved in during the euthanasia procedure. So you can see like a lot of that first part is in the room with the owner prior to the euthanasia procedure happening. And then you can assist with the sedation and IV. The doctor is going to give the final injection and then um, you can bag the body afterwards. Uh, so I wanted to talk here. Um, actually, I just want to talk one more thing. Maybe two more things. Um, these consent forms. I don't know how other hospitals do it, but the hospitals I've been at, we use this consent form to document everything about the euthanasia. So we'll write on here what drugs we gave. Um, we'll write on here, like, yeah, if we're clipping any fur or taking paw prints what urn the owner selected. We'll write everything directly on this form. So if we don't have this form, we are not euthanizing a pet. And that, if you guys remember back to when we talked about medical records, one of the um, violations, potential medical record violations was not having a signed euthanasia consent form. So I will not draw up euthanol without one of these forms. So then we don't run into issues of potentially um, not having the form available or euthanizing the wrong pet. So heaven forbid, that would be a horrible mistake to make. So I just wanted to mention that about the consent forms. And then I have a little bit of a script here for you. I wanted to show you before we talk about grief. So these are the things that whenever I go into a room with an owner, these are the things that I talk about. Okay. So I want to describe the procedure so the client knows what to expect. So I, I want to identify that usually in the treatment area, we're going to give sedation and place an IV catheter. And then in the room with the client, the doctor is going to give the final injection. So um, I, the clinic I worked at last, what we would do is place an IV catheter and have an IV bag attached. That way, um, the owners could even hold the animal while they pass away because uh, we can give the injection further up the IV line and not have to be like right up at the animal. So that's kind of a nice touch. Uh, so I would let them know then that that uh, bag just has saline in it. There's no medication in it. Uh, so when I've described that procedure, I'll, so maybe I'll just describe it to you as if I'm talking to an owner. So um, I would say to them, okay, so usually how we do uh, a euthanasia procedure is that um, I'm gonna have one of the technologists come and take Fluffy to the treatment area. In the treatment area, we're gonna give her some sedation and we are gonna place an IV catheter. Uh, that catheter is gonna have um, a line attached to it so that the doctor can give the injection through the line. And then you could even still hold Fluffy while you'd like while she passes away. Um, and then once you're ready, I'll have the doctor come in and they're gonna give that final injection. So that final injection is an anesthetic overdose. It's gonna stop the brain and then it's gonna stop the heart. So at no time then does your animal feel any pain during the euthanasia process. Okay, so that's how I kind of talk about that. I'm gonna describe the sedation effects. So um, when, I, when I bring them in after they've had their sedation, they might seem really sleepy, that's totally normal. Uh, it might take them a little bit of time to feel sleepy, that's normal too. Uh, you usually start to set in about five to 10 minutes. Uh, depending on the drug, I might have to identify if they're gonna vomit or have any other symptoms as well. Uh, and then I'm going to describe that final injection. Oh, I kind of did that already. I say that it's an anesthetic overdose. It stops the brain from feeling pain and then it stops the heart. Um, so uh, I let them know that the doctor will confirm that the patient has passed away and that the eyes will remain open at that time. And I let the clients know that they can take as long as they need to say goodbye. We do not want to rush our clients through euthanasia. Typically, I like to schedule euthanasia appointments either around lunchtime or right at the end of the day or first thing in the morning because that's when it's quietest in the clinic. If it's right at the end of the day, I will stay late for a patient or for a client to say goodbye to their owner or to their pet. Sorry, I'm mixing up my words here. I don't want them to ever feel rushed at this time because that's really insensitive. And then I need to establish a plan. 
So once the adopter has uh, said that, you know, the animal has passed away, do they want to leave when they're ready? Do they want me to come in and check on them at a certain time after? So I confirm with them which they prefer because I don't want them sitting in a room waiting for me and I'm expecting them to just leave. Uh, even if they said they're just going to leave after like five or ten minutes, I'll sometimes go in and just see if they need anything because sometimes they change their mind after and they see their animal laying on the table and they feel like it's too heartbreaking to walk away and leave the animal alone. So in which case I'm giving them the option to say, uh, actually you can take her, we're done. Uh, and then if the client asks you what happens to the body after, well, we've gone over the cremation things. Um, we, we, I'd make sure they know all that and they're comfortable with that. But I tell them that we keep them in a temperature controlled environment until the cremation company picks them up. I don't tell them, oh, we pop them in the freezer because that sounds un unpleasant, right? But if it's a temperature controlled environment, I mean, it's a freezer, um, they, it just sounds a little nicer. Okay, so let's talk grief. So there are lots of stages of grief. There's like the five common ones, but not everyone experiences all of those stages and not all of them are in the same order. Uh, so the stages are denial, anger, guilt, depression, and acceptance. I've seen in like human ones, like the stages of your own grief is bargaining. Um, but when we're talking pet grief, usually we're seeing more of that guilt. People feel bad, like maybe they should have done more or something for their pets. So stages could come in a recognized sequence or sometimes they're just a series of complex emotions and feelings. Uh, so owners are kind of bouncing around there. The length of each stage is gonna vary and some people bounce back to particular stages time and time again. Uh, so that the process of grief, grief is a really tricky one for owners. Uh, some people reach that resolution, that acceptance very quickly. Others, it takes years. Like my mom's, my mom's dog died four years ago and she, uh, it died at home. It had a rupture, a ruptured mass that she didn't realize about and um, and he passed away at home and she feels very traumatized from it still and is still really upset. And it's four years later. So, um, you know, it can take some people a really long time. So our job sometimes involves being a bit of a grief counselor and speaking to people about their feelings and how, they, how they're handling it. But if anything goes beyond... Um, just basic kind of listening and hearing them out, I would direct them to a more professional help. So the Humane Society does offer a pet grief helpline. Uh, I think they have like meetings and stuff like that. I would direct them in, in that direction. Usually clinics are gonna have brochures about it um, available. Uh, and that's where I always direct owners that are having a hard time with grief. Uh, okay, so that's everything I wanted to say about euthanasia. Um, it can definitely be a hard time in the clinic for owners and, and for us as well, especially if you have one of those days where there's just a lot of euthanasias, you kind of go home just feeling ugh, like it's, it's hard sometimes. Um, so please make sure you do have a good support system available to you. Uh, and if, if you don't have a good support system, make sure you do have some kind of plan in place to help take care of your mental health. We are going to talk about vet, vet medicine and mental health and mental wellness uh, coming up in this course. I think it is an important topic and I think euthanasia definitely, you know, contributes to some of those problems that people might be experiencing. Um, okay, so thank you for listening to this video lecture. There are textbook pages you can read about euthanasia and, um, and grief. Let me just find them for you because I wasn't smart enough to pull them out prior. So the, oh God. I can't find my pages now. Okay, so euthanasia or gr grieving clients is covered on pages 228 to 236 in your textbook. Um, so if you do have any questions or uh, anything you'd like to talk further about, please do ask those questions in the virtual classroom, in the chat, or by sending me an email. Okay, thanks so much for listening. Goodbye.